being a good Jewish boy, I was uh, sort of uh, groomed to be a doctor. And as I got uh, into college and in medical school, the thing that really fascinated me was how the organ of the brain was the basis for what made people who they were, their personality, their behavior, and uh, then by extension in terms of medicine, uh, what went wrong when individuals had ver various types of mental illnesses. And uh, at the time, this was in the 1960s, 1970s, a period of great sort of ferment in our culture and uh, a real transformative process in biomedical research and understanding how the brain was really governed by connections of millions of cells uh, you, which uh, had synapses which were controlled by neurochemicals. And by using small amounts of pharmacologic agents, you could affect changes which had these very powerful effects on human behavior. So this was fascinating, and I saw that, one, this offered a means to understand how the brain worked and how it produced mental functions in human behavior, and two, how treatments could be developed that could correct disturbances in people's mental functions, alter what had been historically untreatable and often lethal illnesses like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, um, which for the first time in history could potentially be treated medically. So uh, as somebody who was a, a medical student thinking about what specialty to go into, uh, I was attracted to the brain, I was attracted to behavior, and it was at a time when psychiatry was offering more than just understanding behavior in the context of psychoanalytic theory or other theories for which there was no really provable scientific basis. Well, there are many challenges that uh, mental health care providers face today in terms of providing the best quality care to people with mental illnesses um, that science uh, enables us to do. Um, you know, one is the fact that uh, we need to sort of dispel the stigma associated with the illness so that, with these illnesses so that people will uh, be aware of what they or their loved ones may suffer from and seek help for it. Um, but then in addition, in providing mental health care in the optimal way, it's very clear that this is really a team effort. Um, it can't be just a doctor giving a pill. It's not just correcting some neurochemical or neurobiological uh, disturbance in the brain it's basically enabling somebody to stabilize and to regain their life. So oftentimes it's correcting the initial problem uh, pharmacologically, but then it's reintroducing a person back into the educational setting that they were in, the job setting, being able to reconnect them with their uh, family and establishing social relationships. And so uh, it's like if you have somebody who uh, experiences some orthopedic trauma. They need hip replacement or joint replacement or a broken bone. They need physical therapy afterwards. And perhaps that they've fallen out of the workforce so they need some kind of counseling as to how to get back in. With mental illness, a person is derailed from what they were doing, plus they lose their mental equilibrium in understanding how do they navigate through the world. Now, the good thing is, is that this is treatable and recovery is eminently possible. Um, the more challenging thing is how do you put together the multidisciplinary team to provide this to people so that they can make it all the way back to recover and resume their lives as if uh, uh, you know, they hadn't lost a step and nothing had happened. Mental illness, even though it's been historically not well understood and not uh, optimally treated, really offers the low-hanging fruit in terms of providing better health care to the people in our society. And what is required for that is in order to is in, uh, ensuring that there is adequate insurance coverage, whether it's through the government, through private carriers, for scientifically proven treatments that we know work and should be made available, shouldn't be withheld from people. So at a policy level, we do need to have adequate coverage and we need to have comparable or equal coverage for mental health care as for medical and, and surgical care. In addition to that, um, uh, there needs to be a more proactive approach. Because mental illness is less well understood, 
because people often have reticence about acknowledging that they have it, even if they are aware of it. Um, we can't, mental health care providers can't just sit back in hospitals and clinics in their offices and wait for people to come in or be referred to them. We need to have more of a public health approach where we engage people who may be affected in the community. Um, given the fact that many of these illnesses have their onset, young and early in life, in school, college, um, the school system, the educational system is a perfect way to begin to have screening or to have more mental health care providers sort of located or available to provide help. Another place is the primary care system. Um, there should be mental health providers that are either co-located or immediately accessible to pediatricians, family medicine doctors, uh, obstetricians for pre- and postnatal care. Um, also potentially in the workplace because presenteeism and absenteeism is a, a major economic drag on businesses and we know that mental illness is a major contributor to presenteeism and absenteeism. So uh, having a means of uh, easy access to mental health care for, uh, in the workplace would be uh, an innovative approach. So I think that the combination of legislation that provides adequate uh, reimbursement and coverage for mental health care and then taking what we know and moving it out of an institution or office-based setting into community institutions, whether it's the educational school system, whether it's the primary care system, whether it's the workplace, could have a very major transformative impact in a relatively short period of time.